we don't have a whole lot of time, so let's just begin. Um, I was thinking maybe we would, rather than have questions, um, have sort of fields of play. This happens an awful lot in your music. Um, one of them might be uh, happiness. Uh, <laughs> you spoke about happiness before. I'm trying to think of things that we, we discussed today. Um, sex, politics, religion, could be some other ones. But, um, but let's start with happiness. Um, we talked a little bit earlier today about the difference between happy and, and glücklich, which yes. doesn't quite work in English since one of the words is German. But um, <laughs> there is a uh, word heiter, heiterkeit, sometimes translated as serenity. Yes, sorry. And uh, the notion that there could be various kinds of happiness in a piece of music. Well, the idea of happiness, um, normally I didn't use such words, but uh, I once had a discussion with a wonderful composer, which was maybe a little bit sensitive when I discussed with him, and he said to me, you are an Adonian, uh, musica negativa guy, <laughs> and um, you never had the experience he speak in, spoke in German. Uh, sie war niemals einfach beim Komponieren happy. We use this word. And audience was totally enthusiastic about what he said. <laughs> it's basically good. Yes. You, you, <laughs> and you, you were never once happy as a composer. And I never told him, happy. you are right, I was never happy, but I was glücklich. <laughs> uh, this, I, I used this uh, word a little bit, you know, happy. It is uh, uh, how it's called, the, the man who thinks. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> that means, that means uh, happy means to forget about his problems, to forget everything and to be. And it's okay, I also like to be happy. And glücklich is, has another quality, has maybe, not forget about, but to feel his energy stronger than all that problems. And the composer, I think, Beethoven never was happy. Uh, Bobby McFerrin, oh, <laughs> um, but he was glücklich. And when we talked about, I even said, even when writing, pieces which are totally um, in the journalistic terminology, tragic, tragic pieces. Uh, the, the second movement in the Eroica, uh, March, Finepo. The composer felt his, his energy as an inventor and as making them, so he was really quickly. He, was, he felt his strength and he was in such, uh, I prefer this to all uh, the ideas of music as an affect um, medium. And I don't, I know exactly that uh, that's what we call express, expression uh, has to happen. But it is not the composer who makes the arrangement of that. It's, uh, expression comes on the backside of this, what the composer is doing. The composer is inventing, is working, which is a wonderful job, <laughs> wonderful activity, and then he might be surprised himself about the intensity of the expression. And it might be uh, totally tragic. One knows that Gustav Mahler, when he heard the first time, the whole run through of his sixth symphony, he was totally finished, he was weeping. Uh, the expression was much stronger than he could imagine before. He was working, I don't know how many months, to, to write this piece. And so um, this is for me important because sometimes we speak about, uh, okay, uh, sometimes we, we, speak, we speak too easily, too quickly about what we call ex expression. This, again, should happen, but as a phenomenon, phenomenon of the sovereignty of spirit, I don't know if my English is <laughs> limited, uh, this is always glücklich and it is serene. It is, uh, serene is not 
tragic, it's not uh, joyful something, but it is uh, sovereign. It, it is an incredible, uh, it's an uh, intensity which I think happens in art. And this is a, for me an important uh, medium of, of, of discussion. Uh, therefore, I, we spoke about this phenomenon, happy and glücklich or serene as a, as, as a situation of intensity in the musical medium. Even maybe as a medium of transcendence, that means the sounds and material. We hear a lot of more or less interesting sounds or noises, but interesting is boring. I don't, well, maybe it might be interesting in a technical way, or when I have less not still heard in a concert hall, such things. But this is one, is what once Michael Gielen asked me when I try to, exp to describe my way of finding uh, sound elements. He said, where is the transcendence? Where it is more than just interesting uh, sounds, even, uh, also more than just a feeling and an effect, it, it is what I would say is the, the presence of a creative spirit. This is art in comparison to a lot of wonderful mediums we live with uh, in the entertainment, which I respect totally, or in other cultures and the beauties of Asian art or all these other uh, cultures. They are wonderful things, but the European, the Occidental way of art has this speciality. Maybe a sort of irritating uh, medium, but irritation means, or even provocation means, invite us to open our horizon. This might be disturbing if one wants to be together in this nice, uh, Ambiente, where man was before, inviting to open his horizon, inviting to open his ears, inviting to open his heart, open his, to open himself. And this is a, always a sort of irritation, and sometimes it is a wonderful challenge. And there, the definition of art, to me, seems now more and more important, uh, because in the politics and everywhere, one makes not more any difference. When I have to go, for instance, to Japan, I have in the visa, or I'm a businessman or I'm an entertainer. <laughs> it's clear. I have to make my cross as an entertainer. <laughs> and, uh, okay, why not? not? Holding a microphone on stage and singing, don't worry, be happy. So. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> no, and entertainment is, uh, I think, it's, it's a respectful service. It is what I sometimes call a sort of Magic, we, maybe we need, maybe we need sometimes to forget about problems. Just to be not, not to begin, not, not to be sick. <laughs> but uh, it's another sort of communication than art. And this difference, I think, is helpful to think about. I did this today with the students of the Manhattan School, and I had wonderful reactions, questions, critical questions, which helped me to think more about this. Issue. I feel like I'm curling. <laughs> it's just, I sort of started and I just let one of these little stones go on the ice and, you know, it's perfect. Um, can, can you hear me okay if I do this or no? Better with this, okay. Um, so it strikes me that, I mean, what you're doing right now is kind of very similar to what your, your music does. And one of, the, one of the pleasures of finally getting to meet you after listening to your music for kind of a while is that, um, the same game gets played. One one hands a word out, or one hands over some some object that signifies that means something, and you mull it over, and you accept its meaning, and then you start mulling it over again, and you start cracking it and misusing it a little bit, and then you start misusing, misusing. misusing yeah, misbehaving. <laughs> I mean, I did mention sex earlier, and uh, you know, I'm thinking specifically from a Freudian standpoint. I mean, uh, to paraphrase, uh, uh, sometimes a cello is just a cello, um, but not here. <laughs> and um, cello was so happy. <laughs> I think. Tell us, tell us about cello happiness. No, I think uh, this is 
uh, Vaisnachello was not tortured. It was treated in a, in, in a very corporal way. We felt uh, the touch, the t uh, touching a, a string on a bow, and we felt the touch of a bow on, on a part of the corpus and all the things. I think this is another idea of beauty, of, of, of uh, another way of our sensorium, our physical sensorium, to open it and to, normally we do not he hear that things, not in a, in a concert hall. And sometimes I said, I also say today, uh, now you are very kindly listening what I'm saying, but you don't dare hear my voice, which is a little bit uh, like this. So uh, I, I, I should maybe a little bit misuse my voice to understand, to hey, speak like this or so. And then you, understand, you hear the physical element. And then happens when begin, one begins to hear the physical uh, aspect and one begins to laugh. Interesting. It seems to be a taboo, that things. And uh, so um, in such a piece like uh, Passion for Cello, which is a rather old piece, written in 69, so it's almost uh, half a century, I think, yes? No, no, 40 years. Okay, I should not exaggerate. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, and I think, uh, I don't know if, you, if we intellectually understand what happened, but you see, I didn't avoid the so-called philharmonic sound. There comes one, a D flat, with a big crescendo, and she's, with this one way of touching such an instrument, and the other way it's touched in a more violent way, or in a more uh, uh, sensitive way. I don't know how to say it in English. And so we have another way of, of context. And to hear the old, good old notes we know before in another context is a sort of uh, Befreiung. Uh, what does it mean? Yes. Uh, and, well, 69, it was a time of the student revolts, and we were young, and, and we had to find another sort of beauty. Because do you always make such a beautiful or exotic effects just in a concert hall to, to entertain uh, the intellectual uh, listeners by, by uh, more science fiction sounds or so? Uh, so the, I did, we were asked as composers, what are you doing in such a situation with, in, if, in, in which the concert hall is a sort of to flee there and to forget about problems? And on the other hand, it's totally senseless to make any propaganda in a, with a piece. But what is possible is to remember each listener that he is able to open and to change his um, possibility to communicate. And this, to remember that we have something like a sensorium, and to remember that there is a human spirit who, with his decisions, uh, makes possible this. This is uh, maybe even, in a certain way, a sort of political uh, message. In a, in a totalitarian system, it would, this would not be allowed, because thinking people would be disturbing. In such a, so um, more I cannot expect from this. But in that time, we had such a sort of, more or less, um, we had to give our answers to the political aspect of sounds. And, and there were a lot of composers, and they made a cantata about, about a bad society, about the Holocaust, about a lot of things. And people went there, and they were more or less moved, and they clapped their hand, and then they went home, and it was short. It was, at the end, just nice music. And so, in that time already, I said, a, a bagatelle from Webern is much more um, irritating, also ideologically, ideologically than uh, all that uh, symphonic uh, pieces which one sees the composer wants us to be moved. And if I hear that a composer wants me to be moved, I do not. I repel. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm moved if something is totally innocent and consequent in itself. So I'm, I'm much more moved by, uh, about uh, maybe a Bach invention. 
which doesn't have such a speculation. Only is consequent in itself. And so this was my answer in a, in a situation where a lot of composers or young men um, try to make a sort of political music. I think I see the red light. This means we go. Um, but th thanks so much for being the 108th composer to be portrayed uh, on the stage. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to being moved. Thank <laughs> you.